I remember the day I met Laura like it was yesterday, not over a decade ago. It was at a mutual friend's barbecue, the kind of casual summer affair where you show up for the burgers, but stay for the conversation. Laura was magnetic, her laughter a melody that seemed to dance through the air. She had a way of making every mundane detail seem fascinating. We spent that whole afternoon talking, and by the time the sun set, I knew I was in trouble. We married a year later, in a small ceremony by the lake. Those early years were filled with a kind of joy that I thought was bulletproof. I was working in construction then, long hours under the sun, but every evening I returned home to Laura, it felt worth it. She worked as a receptionist at a dental office downtown, always with a story to tell at dinner. We were young, in love, and thriving, or so I thought. The financial crisis of 2008 hit us hard. Construction projects dry up overnight, and the stability we built felt as precarious as a house of cards. Laura and I would sit across from each other at our small kitchen table, her eyes filled with the worry she tried to hide, discussing our options. That's when truck driving came into the picture. It wasn't my dream job, but it promised steady income and benefits. Laura was hesitant. The idea of me being on the road for weeks didn't sit well with her. But choices were limited and we needed a plan. So I signed up for a truck driving course encouraged by a local company's offer to cover my tuition in exchange for a year of employment. Laura supported me through every late night study session and every weekend practice run. When I finally got my commercial driver's license, it felt like we'd weathered the storm together. But the road had its own plans, the stretches away from home grew longer, and the quick calls from motels and truck stops became our sorry substitutes for kisses and shared meals. Each return home was joyful yet tinged with the silent acknowledgement of the growing space between us, the unspoken fears and unshared experiences that started to line our conversations like cracks in a well-worn road. In retrospect, those days had an ominous air, a lull before a storm we never saw coming. If I'd known then what heartache lay ahead, would I have walked away from that trucking job, or was the storm inevitable? Perhaps some things like the slow-moving clouds that promise a thunderstorm, are simply beyond our control. I had barely been driving a truck for a year when the reality of our chosen compromise began to gnaw at me. Laura and I had promised to make it work, to bridge the physical distance with countless phone calls, texts, and small surprises mailed back and forth. Yet each time I pulled out of our driveway, a piece of my resolve crumbled. One chilly evening, I found myself at a truck stop just outside Topeka, staring at the endless rows of rigs lined up like soldiers. I called Laura, hoping to hear her voice, to remind myself why I was doing all this. But she didn't answer, and the voicemail I left felt hollow. I wonder about the dinner she might be having, the smile I was missing, the details of a day I wouldn't know. It was then I realized promises were easy to make but hard to keep when your life is lived on the move. A few weeks later, during a rare weekend home, Laura and I found ourselves at another kind of crossroad. Over breakfast, she hesitantly brought up the strain my absence was causing her. Tom, I'm not sure how much longer I can do this, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. The vulnerability in her eyes was a punch to my gut. I reached across the table, taking her hands in mine, feeling the coldness of her fingers. We'll find a way, I said, more to convince myself than her. We've always figured things out, right? Laura nodded, but her smile didn't reach her eyes. That conversation lingered with me as I hit the road again. With each mile, I felt the weight of our situation growing heavier. I knew something had to give, or we'd break under the pressure. The decision came unexpectedly when my dispatcher offered me a lucrative long haul to California. It was a two-week trip that could potentially lead to more high-paying jobs. The promise of financial stability was tempting, but it meant more time away from Laura. I hesitated, torn between the needs of my home and the demands of my job. That night, as I lay in a motel room, staring at the ceiling, I called Laura. I got offered another long route. It pays well but I'd be gone for another two weeks, I told her, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside. There was a pause, a breath held too long. Maybe this is good, Tom, Laura finally responded, her voice gentle but strained. We need the money, and it's just two more weeks. But at what cost? I asked, sitting up, feeling suddenly that I might lose everything over a few extra dollars. We'll make up for lost time, she said, and I could hear the forced optimism in her tone. I accepted the job, but as I hung up, I made a promise to myself. This would be the last long trip. I'd find something local, something that wouldn't keep me away from the home we were trying to build. It was a promise laden with hope, a bet on our future. Little did I know, it was a promise on borrowed time, 
and the storm we thought we weathered was just beginning to brew. The trip to California was grueling but uneventful, filled with long nights and endless highways. As I dropped off the last load, my dispatcher, Shirley, called with another job, a special assignment that she said would be a great opportunity for me. It involved hauling a load of delicate, high-end furniture to a remote island owned by my boss, Mr. Carter. The furniture was for his new guest house, a secretive project he had been planning without his wife's knowledge. I'm trusting you with this, Tom. It's a big deal, and Mr. Carter specifically requested you for the job, Shirley explained. I sensed the gravity in her voice, the hint of something unspoken beneath her words. You'll take it to the island, and that's it. Simple drop and go. Don't discuss this with anyone, not even Laura. The air of secrecy piqued my curiosity, but it also settled a weight on my chest. The job paid exceptionally well, enough to perhaps take a break from the road, to spend more time with Laura. With this rationalization, I accepted, not realizing the depth of the deception I was about to uncover. After a long drive to Vancouver to pick up the furniture, and another lengthy trek back to the island located off the coast of Maine, I arrived at the dock where a small ferry was waiting to transport the furniture and myself to the island. The weather was dreary, a mist hanging low over the water, as if nature itself was setting the stage for the revelation to come. I was greeted by Mr. Carter's assistant, who directed the unloading. Mr. Carter and his wife are here for the weekend, just getting everything ready for the big reveal. He commented offhandedly as we worked. The word wife echoed in my head as we approached the main house. The assistant had mentioned Mr. Carter's presence, but nothing prepared me for the scene I encountered. I caught sight of them through the large glass windows of the guest house, Mr. Carter and a woman, not his wife, entangled in what was unmistakably an intimate moment. My heart sank as the woman turned slightly, and I recognized Laura. My Laura. The shock knocked the breath from me. I stumbled back, hidden by the shadows, watching as the man I worked for touched my wife with a familiarity that tore through me like a blade. I stood frozen, the fabric of my reality unraveling thread by thread. Gathering what little composure I had left, I confronted them. I cleared my throat, stepping into the light, my presence startling them apart. Mr. Carter looked bewildered, unsure of who I was at first. Then recognition dawned, his expression morphing into one of guilt and then defiance. Tom, Laura gasped, her voice a whisper of despair. The world seemed to halt, the only sounds the crashing waves and my pounding heartbeat. I brought your furniture, Mr. Carter, I managed to say, my voice steady despite the tempest inside me. To Laura, I could barely muster the words, I think you should get dressed. Turning my back on the scene, I walked out, the cold air slapping me awake. This wasn't just a betrayal, it was a complete upheaval of everything I believed about my life, about Laura, about us. The island, meant to be a place of secluded beauty, had unveiled a painful truth, one that changed everything. The drive back from the island was a blur of tortured thoughts and unanswered questions. Each mile put distance between Laura and me, but nothing could distance my mind from the images seared into it. When I returned home, the silence of our house was suffocating. Every corner a reminder of the life Laura and I had shared, now tainted by betrayal. In those first few weeks, I moved through the motions like a ghost haunting his own life. I couldn't bear to face Laura, to hear her explanations or excuses. Instead, I focused on what I could control, my work and my future. I quit the long-haul job, a decision that felt like cutting off a diseased limb to save the body. I turned back to my roots in construction, picking up small local projects. The physical labor was grueling but healing, allowing me to channel my anger and pain into something tangible. One afternoon, as I was repairing the deck, I realized I couldn't stay in our home any longer, surrounded by memories of a life that no longer existed. I decided to sell a house and move into a small apartment. It was a stark, unadorned place, but it was a blank slate, something I desperately needed. As the months passed, I found solace in solitude and work. My hands, once used to the gentle touch of Laura's back, now wielded hammers and saws with equal familiarity. The transformation wasn't just in my surroundings, but in myself. I grew tougher, the raw edges of my pain hardening into something more resilient. It was during this time that I discovered a new hobby that soon turned into a passion, metalworking. A friend introduced me to the craft, and I took to it with the fervor of a man desperate for distraction. There was something profoundly satisfying about molding cold, hard metal into beautiful, intricate designs. It was a way to rebuild from the ashes of my former life, creating beauty from the raw materials of my pain. I started attending local craft fairs, selling pieces I made in my small workshop. The response was encouraging, 
and it wasn't long before I began receiving custom orders. Metalworking wasn't just a hobby. It was a lifeline, pulling me from the depths of my despair. One evening, while setting up a booth at a craft fair, I met Anita, a fellow artist who specialized in glass blowing. She had a vibrant spirit that was infectious, and her easy laughter reminded me of a time before my heart had been broken. We quickly became friends, and she introduced me to her circle of artists and craftsmen. For the first time in a long time, I felt a sense of community, a sense of belonging. Anita and I grew closer, and though I was wary of opening my heart again, her sincerity and warmth slowly thawed the ice around it. We shared long conversations over coffee, discussing art, life, and our dreams. It wasn't romantic at first, but there was a connection, a bond forged by shared passions and mutual respect. Rebuilding from the ashes of my old life wasn't easy, but with each piece of metal I shaped and each smile I shared with Anita, I was slowly piecing together a new existence, one where I could be whole again. This new life wasn't what I had planned, but perhaps it was what I needed, a life where I could find beauty in the broken places. Several months into my journey of self-reinvention, Anita invited me to join her at the local Renaissance Festival. She thought it would be a perfect venue to showcase my metalwork, particularly the ornate, medieval-inspired pieces that had become my specialty. Reluctant but intrigued, I agreed to set up a booth over the weekend. The festival was like stepping into another world, a vibrant tableau of jesters, knights, and minstrels that mingled with the smells of roasted meats and sweet mead. As I arranged my display of hand-forged swords, shields, and intricate jewelry, I felt a surge of excitement, a feeling I hadn't experienced in a long time. The lively atmosphere was infectious, and I found myself drawn into the spirit of the event. To my surprise, my booth attracted a steady stream of festival goers. Their genuine interest in my work and their appreciation for the craftsmanship lifted my spirits. Many were intrigued by the stories behind each piece, and I found myself enjoying the interactions, sharing tales of how each item was inspired and crafted. As the day progressed, I noticed a woman lingering near my booth, her eyes scanning my displays with an artist's keen interest. Her name was Alina, and she introduced herself as a local theater director looking for props and costume pieces for an upcoming production of Shakespeare's Macbeth. Her enthusiasm for my work was flattering, and we quickly struck up a conversation about the possibility of collaborating. Alina's interest led to a commission for several pieces for her production, and as we worked together, I was drawn into her world of theater and performance. She invited me to a dress rehearsal, and watching my creations come to life on stage was a profoundly gratifying experience. It sparked a new creative flame in me, an interest in combining my metalwork with dramatic storytelling. Buoyed by the success at the festival and my burgeoning partnership with Alina, I began to consider other ways to merge my craft with local arts. I started attending more cultural events, each time setting up a booth, each time reaching a new audience. The community's warm reception gave me a sense of belonging and purpose that I hadn't realized I was missing. Through these festivals, I also discovered a new community of artisans who were as passionate about their crafts as I was about mine. We shared techniques, ideas, and occasionally collaborated on projects. This network of creative individuals became a new kind of family, one bound not by blood, but by the shared love of art and expression. This new chapter at the Renaissance Festival was more than just a venue for selling my work. It was a gateway to a new life. It helped me weave my personal losses into a tapestry of creativity and new beginnings. Each festival, each applause at Alina's theater, stitched my past pain into a story of resilience and rebirth. Here, amidst the mock battles and bartered crafts, I found a way to rewrite my own history, not as a tale of loss, but as an ongoing saga of discovery and transformation. As the weeks turned into months, I continued to immerse myself in the local art scene, reveling in the camaraderie and shared creativity. The Renaissance Festival had become a regular part of my calendar, and with each event, my skills as a metal worker grew, as did my reputation. My booth, once a curiosity, had become a staple among the regular festival goers, who often stopped by just to see what new creations I had on display. One crisp autumn morning, as I was setting up for another festival weekend, I noticed a new vendor setting up across from my booth. Her name was Mia, and she specialized in handmade textiles, weaving vibrant colors into patterns that told stories of their own. Her booth was a splash of color against the more subdued tones of my metalwork, and throughout the day, I found myself stealing glances at the way she interacted with her customers, her hands as skilled with fabric as mine were with metal. During a lull in the afternoon, Mia walked over with a warm smile, holding a steaming cup of apple cider. 
I thought you might like a little warmth, she said, handing me the cup. It's a bit chillier today, don't you think? I thanked her, surprised by the gesture, and we began to chat. I learned that Mia had recently moved to the area and was looking to establish her business at local events. As we talked, I found myself drawn to her easy laughter and the earnestness in her eyes. There was something refreshing about her, something that made the long hours of the festival seem to fly by. Over the next few days our booths continued to face each other, and our brief exchanges grew into longer conversations. We shared meals during breaks, and I introduced her to Elena and some of the other regulars. Mia fit right into our little community, her vibrancy a perfect complement to the eclectic group. As the festival season wound down, Mia and I began to meet outside of work. Coffee gates turned into walks in the park, where we talked about everything from our businesses to our pasts. I learned about her journey from a small town to making her way as an artist, her resilience in the face of challenges, and her hopes for the future. One evening, as we closed up our booths under the glow of the setting sun, Mia hesitated before leaving. Tom, I've really enjoyed spending time with you these past weeks, she said, her voice tinged with a hint of nervousness and I was wondering if you'd like to go to dinner with me sometime as a date. I was taken aback, not just by her asking, but by the realization that I too had been looking forward to our talks, to her smiles. It had been a long time since I had considered the possibility of dating, of opening up my heart again after Laura. But with Mia, things felt different. They felt right. I'd like that, I replied my heart light for the first time in a long while. I'd like that very much. Dinner led to more dates, and before I knew it, Mia had become a part of my life in a way I hadn't anticipated. It was unexpected, this companionship that bloomed amidst the backdrop of medieval fantasy and artisan crafts, but it was a welcome chapter in my life. With Mia, I found not just a partner, but a kindred spirit, someone who understood the language of creativity and the rhythms of an artist's life. Our relationship, built on mutual respect and shared passions, promised a new beginning, a chance to love again in the autumn of my discontent. As the days grew colder and the leaves turned, my relationship with Mia deepened. Our connection, spark at the Renaissance Festival, flourished as we shared more of our lives with each other. However, as with any burgeoning romance, the more we intertwine our lives, the more we encountered challenges that tested the strength of our bond. One chilly evening, as Mia and I were enjoying a quiet dinner at her apartment, she broached a subject we had skirted around, but never fully addressed, our past relationships. The conversation began innocently enough, with both of us sharing light-hearted stories of awkward dates and youthful misadventures. But the tone shifted when Mia asked about the more serious aspects of my past, particularly what had happened with Laura. I hesitated, the old pain lurking beneath the surface. Mia noticed my discomfort and gently took my hand. Tom, you don't have to tell me if you're not ready, but I want you to know you can share anything with me. I'm here for you, she said, her eyes filled with warmth and understanding. Encouraged by her kindness, I opened up about the entire ordeal the discovery of Laura's infidelity, the heartbreak, the divorce, and how it had reshaped my view on relationships. Maya listened intently, her expression one of empathy. When I finished, she squeezed my hand, her gesture a silent thank you for my trust. Mia then shared her own story, revealing struggles and hardships she had faced with her ex-partner, who had undermined her confidence and creativity. Her vulnerability in sharing her experiences made me realize how much she trusted me, and it cemented our connection turning empathy into a cornerstone of our relationship. However, revelations were just part of the challenges we faced. Integrating into each other's lives meant dealing with the nuances of daily routines, managing expectations, and respecting boundaries, tasks that were sometimes more daunting than they appeared. Mia's career was gaining momentum, and she often traveled for crap shows and exhibitions. Meanwhile, I found myself trying to balance my time between my metalworking and supporting her, all while managing the lingering shadows of my past hurt. The real test came when I was invited to participate in a major craft fair in another state. The same weekend Maya was scheduled to give a workshop at a well-known art retreat. It was an opportunity neither of us could afford to miss. The clash of schedules forced us to confront the realities of maintaining a relationship when both partners have demanding careers. We sat down one evening, calendars open and notepads in hand, to strategize how we could support each other without sacrificing our professional passions. It was a long discussion, filled with compromises and assurances. Maya proposed alternating visits to each other's events when possible, and I suggested regular check-ins when we were apart to share updates and stay connected. These solutions didn't magically resolve all the challenges, but they were a start. 
Through open communication and mutual support, we navigated the complexities of our lives together. Each challenge we overcame strengthened our relationship, teaching us more about each other and deepening our love. As we adapted to each other's worlds, I realized that the real revelation was not just in the sharing of past pains, but in the daily affirmations of our commitment. In Mia, I found not just a partner but a fellow traveler on a journey filled with challenges and discoveries, each step forward a testament to the resilience of our bond. As the seasons changed and our relationship evolved, Mia and I found ourselves more entwined and committed to a shared future. The challenges we faced, balancing our careers, managing our time apart, and supporting each other through personal growth, had not only tested our bond, but had significantly strengthened it. One crisp Saturday morning, as we walked through a local art fair, hand in hand, surrounded by the vibrant displays and the buzz of creative energy, Mia stopped in front of a booth displaying handcrafted ceramic planters. She picked up a beautifully glazed piece, turning it over in her hands thoughtfully. Tom, she said, her voice tinged with a mix of excitement and seriousness. I've been thinking about our future a lot lately. I looked at her, feeling a flutter of anticipation mixed with nerves. What's on your mind? I asked. I love what we have, and I love you, Mia began, her eyes meeting mine with an intensity that made my heart skip a beat. I think it's time we take the next step. I want us to consider moving in together. The suggestion filled me with a rush of joy and a bit of trepidation. Living together would mean merging our lives not just emotionally but physically, sharing a space that was a testament to our commitment. It was a big step, but as I watched Mia's hopeful expression, I knew it was a step I wanted to take. Yes, I'd like that, I replied, my voice steady despite the racing of my heart. Let's do it. From that moment, we began planning our future with renewed purpose. We found a cozy apartment that offered enough space for both Mia's textile studio and my metalworking shop. Decorating our new home became a joint project that not only reflected our tastes, but also our histories, lending our past experiences with our current lives. Living together brought new dynamics to our relationship, from the mundane tasks of daily chores to the joys of cooking meals together. Each day offered opportunities to learn more about each other, and every evening spent discussing our days reinforced the strength of our partnership. We also made plans for the future that extended beyond our home. We brainstormed joint projects that combined our skills, like a series of workshops where Mia would teach textile arts and I would teach metal crafting. We envisioned these workshops not just as a way to share our passions, but as a means to create something new and meaningful together. Moreover, we started attending more festivals, not just as individual artists, as a couple known for our collaborative spirit and innovative creations. Our booth became a popular spot, known for the unique blend of metal and fabric, a symbol of our partnership. As we forged a life together, our relationship deepened, grounded in the love and respect we had nurtured from our first meeting. The future, once a source of uncertainty, now felt like a canvas waiting for us to fill it with our dreams and ambitions. In Mia, I found not just a partner, but a true companion in the journey of life. Together, we were building a future not just made of love and shared goals, but of mutual inspiration and creativity. This new chapter wasn't just about living together. It was about growing together, crafting a life that was as rich and varied as the art we both loved.